our speaker tonight is actually, I would say, one of the pluses of COVID in that uh, we've learned to use Zoom and we've learned that we don't have to go to meetings just in Chicago. So I was introduced to our speaker by attending a meeting at the Northern, North, Northern California Culinary Historians Group. They were having a little bit of a technical problem. So while they were tap dancing away, um, they asked everybody to introduce themselves. And Susie mentioned that she had done a talk on Trader Joe's. And then I had to leave early because I had another Zoom meeting to attend because that's the life on Zoom is you just go from one meeting to another. And, uh, but delightfully, uh, I contacted them the next day and they put me in contact and we've been going back and forth about Trader Joe's and such ever since. So I'm gonna turn this over to Susie um, because I could, she, you know, She's she's complete package all her own, right, dear? Well, so Susie, thank you. you're welcome. It'll be fun to hear some of your stories after also. I, the presentation should take about half an hour and I hope you enjoy it. The entire premise of this presentation is something I had turned into a book. I'm currently, or I guess permanently in Oakland, California, so I'm, so delighted to be here with you Chicagoans. I've only been to Chicago once, but I know it is a great food city. I'll tell you a little about myself in the course of this presentation. First, I must disclaim that the book and the presentation are not endorsed by Trader Joe's. <laughs> I created the book on my own and I need to make that clear. I grew up in Southern California and about four years ago, we needed to get rid of a car that had been in my family gathering dust in a garage for decades. And I opened the glove box to see if there was a manual so we could add that to our eBay listing, original manual. But instead, all that was there was a 1982 Trader Joe's flyer. I had already self-published one book and I published another book about food business. I've always been into culinary history. And to find this gem, I felt like Indiana Jones. So I pulled it out and started looking at it. And you can see it refers to Pronto Markets, which was the name of Trader Joe's before it became Trader Joe's. The company was founded in 1967 in Southern California. So it's more than 50 years old now. You can see they already were quirky and the fun company that they still are talking about wine prices collapsing. I published another book for kids that included a challenge to compare Trader Joe's cookies. So I'm pretty obsessed with the company and I have been a customer since the late seventies when my dad took me there because he discovered they had cheap Jägermeister. We drove probably 20 miles to get there to save the dollar or whatever it was. So this flyer that I found was from 1982. And as I flipped through it, I thought it was so interesting to see what they were promoting in the flyer, how they were trying to get people to buy the items and how it compared to the way we eat now and the kinds of food we take for granted now. So we will take a time travel back to 1982. In the, the 70s and early 80s, people were becoming foodies. This was a Time Magazine that I had that my mom had saved, where they talked about people going to Zay bars, about Macy's Cellar, about jams, jellies, breads, and that people were really buying lots of specialty foods and getting experimental with cooking at home. That was just after the whole California cuisine movement had started in California also. 
in the late or early 70s, people were starting to get into health foods and learning about the benefits of eating beans and vegetables and grains. And growing up in Southern California as second or first generation Americans, my family loved going to ethnic markets to get snacks. We had Syrian markets, Greek markets. I worked at a, a chocolate shop where they, that's me by the way in that picture, that's my mom in the other picture eating a grape leaf in the 60s. So we were used to seeking out good food and many of you might know that there are already were many European cheese companies in the United States, but the cheeses they made weren't really mainstream. I'm guessing many of you also would buy Boursin if you were having a cocktail party. We would buy these alligators from a Hungarian bakery. My parents were very much into health food. We'd get carrot juice, carob milk, rice crackers. In Los Angeles, you might also remember from Annie Hall when Woody Allen, when they went to the Source restaurant and we're in that whole LA hippie scene. Los Angeles was very much into that discovery phase of natural eating. We had all kinds of restaurants and would eat granola um, where so many other people were eating Cheerios or sugar smacks. There were plenty of imported wines and boozes that people could buy. Yet most people were shopping at mainstream supermarkets and you might go to a local grocer to buy olives or cheeses or other foods that you might not find at, um, I don't know which, of, if you had any of these markets in the Chicago area, I'm sure they're all under Kroger now, <laughs> but you really had to go to an ethnic or a health food store to find the kinds of foods that Trader Joe's started bringing in and introducing people to. So if you imagine you were used to eating white bread with Jif or, or with Smucker's jam, you wouldn't be exposed to the kinds of foods we see today at Trader. And at the time, in 1982, they only had 16 stores and they started in Pasadena. The founder, Joe Colomb, had the premise that Trader Joe's was for overeducated and underpaid people. So it made sense to start in college towns and then they fanned out from there. And it was really cool as I was working on the book, hearing about friends who grew up in these counties around Pasadena who had stories of their parents going to Trader Joe's. The thing about Trader Joe's, which you see today in the flyers in the stores, they made foods that seemed exotic and that were more natural than preservative filled foods that many mainstream brands were marketing. They made it exciting, accessible, and affordable, which as I mentioned, lured my dad to first take us there. We were already eating natural peanut butter in the 70s, but Trader Joe's in, in this 1982 flyer talked about the harvest that the peanuts came from, how it didn't have all these oils and fillers, and in the book, I have snippets from the flyer. This is an example. And they compared their peanut butter to Laura Scudder. So they did that again and again back then to get people to rethink what they were eating. And I must give a shout out that I still turn to Trader Joe's for their organic peanut butter. Although I, I don't think mice like it if you have ever tried to use peanut butter to trap the mouse. So in, in 1982, we, we would go all over the place to get different kinds of bread. You'd get sliced bread at the grocery store, but you'd have to go to a specialty bakery to, to get many other types of breads. At Trader Joe's in that flyer, they had all kinds of interesting breads, this Pillars of Hercules, bread in a can, 
bagels that they talked about the bakery that they came from at great prices and pita bread, which was so cheap that even if you hadn't had an alfalfa sandwich, you might try some pita bread and some something new and maybe healthier than what you were used to. And now I'm sure at your Trader Joe's, there's a world of baguettes and, and all kinds of sliced breads and round breads and everything, gluten-free breads. In this flyer, they it was so small that they talked about the baker that had moved and that they had to find a new baker. So it was, it was just so charming that it was a real storytelling adventure and that gave you all kinds of details about the prices and the ingredients. What I really loved was that they not only had bran muffins, which was a staple in my diet, but that they had come up with a mix that you could mix in your own sweetener. Think about that so long ago. That, that must have been revolutionary to have that idea of mixing your own sweetener. Right now at Trader Joe's, they have a Pfeffernoose cookie mix, which I love Trader Joe's Pfeffernoose cookies, but I don't think they have them, yet you can make them at home. And then a Stroopwafel mix. This really shows, if you imagine back then, you never would have found anything like this at a, at a mainstream store that's so popular now. There's 86 people. Then as an example of how they really I'm were from catering. The Chicago. Oh. <laughs> um, how they were catering to the educated consumer. There was this entire treatise about the economics of the Russians and the Africans and the cashews. I find it so delightful. And they named their buyer, Doug Rao who I'll talk about a little later, who became the president of Trader Joe's and he was there for about 30 years. But it talks about how he scored 57,000 pounds of cashews at very low prices. Obviously it's harder to give these specifics now that the chain is so big, but that's where they came from to engage people. And now there's no end to the rotation of interesting and fun flavors that come in. Just today, I went there and there were so many new kinds of nut mixes I hadn't seen before. The bagel spices are so popular now too. I thought it was interesting that with both the design of the packaging and the flavors, they're doing things to get people to keep experimenting and trying. This is another crazy thing that they talked about rennetless cheese. And I think only in the 90s did I learn about how to make cheese and I bought my first rennet. But to get people to think about why do you care if there's rennet in your cheese and that it's the substance taken from the lining of a cow's stomach. Can you imagine promoting a cheese and talking about a cow's stomach in the same blurb? I'm guessing it did well. <laughs> then they also, again, with the juice, talked about the harvest and compared it to Welch's. And now they still have the supreme brie that they had then. I wanted to mention that because I think that's so great that they have maintained this relationship with the producer of supreme brie. When you go to Trader Joe's, you can see it under that name. and know that it's been around that long. It's a real staple for shoppers. It was funny to see that there was this fish that was, um, now I, yeah, it's a herring called pilchard, which I just thought was interesting. I'd never heard that word before. And I think it's just a bat. If they renamed it something else, they probably would sell more, but that's something that no longer exists. Or if it does, it has a new name. What I think was so fun about this 
flyer came out in March and Real Men Doni Quiche came out the next month. So I have no way of knowing whether people were still buying as much quiche as they might have the month before or if that book put a, a kibosh on the quiche. <laughs> then spirulina was another thing they were getting people to experiment with. Decaf coffee, again, there was a, this, a long example or a long story about how it, how it was made and thinking about all these things that only in the last 10 years when you look at artisanal foods, they started telling the exact way people crafted things, but Trader Joe's was doing this decades ago. And they also had a little slur against the water in Los Angeles being why coffee was so bad then. Champagne, the flyer had lots of wine and champagne and sherry in it. I, I looked up a few facts about the production back then. It was a lot smaller. People weren't drinking wine every night the way they are during the pandemic. It was really more for special occasions, probably unless you came from a wine drinking family. Um, and they back then talked, told the stories of the wines and it was very cheap, but I find it remarkable that you can still buy wine for almost the same prices, which is really a volume and production thing. So it's interesting to look at. So they had 5,000 cases sold of this Chianti. And there was a great story in the flyer about a church that came in and scooped up a bunch of wine because <laughs> it was so cheap for, for their services. So in, this, in the Time magazine, it talked about how white wine and dry sherry had taken over the, what they said, mind-numbing scotches and martinis of the Mad Men era. <laughs> which was something Trader Joe's being in California had relationships with lots of wine producers. So that was good for them. They also had dog food and you can, they said that was one of their most successful products. I'm guessing even then that was a really good price, $7 for 25 pounds. And now you can do something which I had also seen as a shark tank pick, pitch make biscuits for your dog. So they've continued to evolve their, the whole family being involved in Trader Joe's. This is, I had the opportunity to meet Doug Rao, the man who was the president. And I think before I wrote the book, I saw him give a presentation and thought he was just so thoughtful about conscious capitalism. He had worked in natural foods before he came to, to Trader in the 70s, and he helped Joe Colomb develop the Trader Joe's brand. And now he has a nonprofit store called Daily Table in the Boston area. And I saw they're just expanding to their third store. They get, I believe it's all donations of nearly expired packaged foods. And they have kitchens and train locals how to make prepared foods, which I visited one and you could get a whole meal for a dollar. So he's a really great guy and it was, it was neat to see that he's doing this. So his new endeavor is called Daily Table. Trader Joe's got a CEO named John Shields who was someone who went to college with Joe Colomb and, and he was the one that really accelerated the growth and expansion in the late 80s and his mission was to maximize profit and keep customers happy which sounds so logical and so easy why doesn't everyone do that his vision was an ethical company operating a small chain of neighborhood grocery stores staffed by friendly people having fun and I, I read an article that said that they wouldn't hire anyone if they didn't smile, I think in the first 30 seconds of the interview. Here's a little timeline of Trader Joe's growth. So as you saw in, in 82, they had 16 stores. In 88, they had 19. So barely any growth. 
And I remember when it opened here and I used to drive miles and miles to get there. So not till five years later, the first store opened outside of California. And then by 1995, they had 70 stores and it kept growing and growing. And in 2018, there were about 500 stores, 400, the high 400s. So it, <laughs> I'm speechless. I was gonna say, I used to, when I would go on a road trip, find out the path to where there were Trader Joe's around the country and make sure to stop in all the towns. So even in the mid nineties, I think I, or late nineties, I'd been to like 30 stores, even though there weren't that many. Um, so now just as an example, comparing what people love the most at Trader Joe's to what you saw on the flyer, which were a lot of healthy foods, some fun and interesting foods. They're exotic things like, um, I mean, the almond kringle, which is a pastry is popular, soy chorizo, the whole plant-based food movement is just exploding now. The mandarin orange chicken, orange chicken has been a perennial favorite, but I think it's interesting that so many of them are more decadent, fun desserts and convenient foods, which is in kind of in lockstep with what other stores have seen. This is the last slide. I just wanted to point out that John Shields, the, the CEO who expanded the company so much had described Trader Joe's as a fashion food retailer, which I thought was so interesting, the word fashion. But then today I saw this black truffle cashew pesto sauce. And I thought, wow, if some people had seen that in 1982, what would they have thought? But I see Trader Joe's as exciting, accessible, affordable, dependable, easy, delicious, friendly, enriching, happy making, a community where I have had so many fun conversations in the checkout line. And that is the end of the presentation. And I would love to hear from people about if you remember the first time you heard about Trader Joe's or the first time you went there or, or experiences that kind of reflect what so many other people have had in loving the company. Certainly people could have mute, but I just wanted to add, if you don't mind, just a little bit of extra information because Trader Joe's is part of Aldi, but it's not Aldi that you see here in the United States. It's, which is what, uh, Aldi Nor, uh, Aldi Sud, there's two Aldis because there's two brothers both of them deceased. But Aldi Nord uh, acquired Trader Joe's in the United States like 1978. And apparently Aldi Nord, so they're, they're here only via Trader Joe's. Aldi Sud is in the United States and their headquarters are here in the Chicago area, runs the Aldi stores. And there's some similarity in the sense how they run somewhat. Um, but when you get outside of the United States, the Aldi, oh, I'm going to get this all messed up. All the, uh, the other Aldi that runs the Trader Joe's in the United States runs the Aldi's that are not in the United States. How's that? It's confusing, I know, but nonetheless, you know, an interesting thing. And from what I understand, Trader Joe's started perhaps 1958? 67. 67, okay. Yeah. Um, because one of the things I found in my, re my response to Aldi, as well as Trader Joe's, is not to really fall in love with certain products because they have a way of just disappearing and never coming back. Um, so who would like to make a comment or a question? Yes, iPad. Ah, Ingrid, you wanna say something? You have to unmute yourself, dear. Ingrid, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, okay, thank okay, you. Okay, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you so much for the presentation. 
Um, I my very first visit to uh, Trader Joe's was in California. We were staying with friends in uh, Laguna Niguel, and I don't know how far north of there was probably one of the stores, maybe the one that you were talking about in Pasadena, I'm not sure. But uh, we were so enthralled. We had never seen a store like that. We had never um, uh, experienced all those fun, fun items and the descriptions that we went out and we, we picked out, I don't know how many items to uh, bring back to Chicago. Well, we, we had so much stuff, we had to put it in a suitcase. We bought a, we bought a suitcase just to bring the Trader Joe uh, items back to Chicago. And I've been an avid Trader Joe fan. The other thing is their staff is just phenomenal. Um, I was just going to write in the chat. My mother died about, oh, five years ago. And I mentioned it in the store one day to one of the salespeople that I always say hello to. And she just looked at me and gave me a hug and so, you know, we chatted for a moment and before I left the store, she came up and brought me a beautiful bouquet of flowers. That's Trader Joe's. So thank you, thank you. It's been so interesting. Is it possible for you to uh, show that list again of the uh, favorite items? The one that I knew yeah. that's Mandarin chicken. I have that in my <laughs> freezer right now. And okay. I also have my peanut butter. Sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I think the staff, I, I don't um, I don't know exactly Thank you. how they score such good staff, but I know, I think the staff have a budget or like that they can do extra things for customers, or at least it used to be like that. I don't know if it still is. My mom actually passed away four years ago and she used to love just roving the aisles, looking at everything, reading the packages and they were just so lovely. Yeah. Um, and I, I know everyone, so many people are, are mentioning independent stores, which I love going to independent grocers. So <clears throat> I'm glad that Ch the Chicago area has so many. I'm trying to get back to now. I have a question for you. You know, you've said you make a point of visiting Trader Joe's as you roam around. Do you see differences in the various Trader Joe's? Now, I mean, it, it, it's mainly like that they might not have like my sister in Oregon, they don't have the same alcohol selection because they're not allowed to. Um, not as much as like at Costco, I think you see more variation. So I don't feel like I do as much with Trader Joe's anymore. And I do have family on all the coasts in different areas and we compare notes. So I but, but years ago, was there differences? Um, I honestly don't remember. <laughs> All I know is like, they just like that suitcase you brought home with you, they were always the place I loaded up from. And I love telling the story of when I was going on my first big strenuous camping trip and all of the people going with me were like, why is your pack so heavy? Why are you bringing all that stuff? And they were all trying to eat all my Trader Joe's food when we got to the top of the mountain. <laughs> um, Susan said that Trader Joe's empowers their employees to make decisions and wow the customer with experiences and believe in being a neighborhood store and supporting neighbors, which they do donate a ton of food. Um, and I mean, the, the employees, you just feel a personal connection with them. I feel like it would be nice if, you know, retail would thrive if they could get some of that Trader Joe's magic. As far as the, the difference between Whole Foods, I, I think is Trader Joe's is more like specialty gourmet and they do have healthier versions of foods, but Whole Foods actually has 
an approved ingredient list and that people, they won't let vendors in with their brands if they don't adhere to the ingredient list. And in the old days, Whole Foods had lots of brands. Now they have more of their own private label brand. Uh, you know, obviously Amazon bought them and they're trying to have lower prices. But the big difference is Trader Joe's has most of their food manufactured specifically for them, whereas Whole Foods would buy off the, not off the shelf. They would buy existing brands, foods to, and other goods to stock. I would just like to contribute something. Um, I've been a Trader Joe shopper since they've been in the area there about a mile from here and we've been volunteering at a soup kitchen for 15 years and I linked up with Trader Joe's every week for I don't know how since they've been in the area they give a ton of food whether it's meat dairy vegetables They've been so generous and we have somebody who goes with a van once a week and takes everything up to the soup kitchen and they are so generous. It's such a pleasure. Neat. And their sampling is fun too when they're there. Yeah. Do you remember it used to be you could stop anyone in the aisle and ask them to open a package and they would. Oh, and, then, sure. and then I think because of the food laws, it became more controlled and then they would track it. But it, there were, I, I, I talk about in the book what I discussed and other parts of the business. Like I, I think the sampling and their return policy have been key to making a no brainer decision. It's no brainer to try something new they used to say, if you don't like it, bring it back. Like who else? No one has, else has ever said that. No, they need your receipt and they need your fingerprints, other places. No, yeah. they are, they couldn't be nicer. And I think that they have happy smiles on purpose. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're wonderful. And I, I can't say enough about them. And they never ask you why you're returning anything. Right. Does anyone else have any stories of your first time or <laughs> people demanding for you to mail them stuff <laughs> for Trader Joe's? Um. Oh, email. Oh, should, can I speak up for a minute? Of course. All right. Uh, this is Madeline Bullwinkle. Um, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. Uh, I came tonight because uh, my son and his family love Trader Joe's. A lot of people around me, I teach French cooking and a lot of people around me keep telling me about Trader Joe's. I have to go to Trader Joe's. And I've tried it several times. First, I've never lived very conveniently close to one. Otherwise, I'm sure I would go more often. But it is a trek. And I walk in, and I, it's a kind of scattershot of products. And if I look for something like a whole head of cabbage, I can't find it. Everything is cut up. And uh, I don't trust anything that's cut up. I go over and look for fish and it's all frozen. I look for meat and there's just a little bit. There doesn't seem to be a selection now, I do like their breads. I've gotten some good wines, but nothing to draw me back. And everything that's in a package, anything that's a made in a factory somewhere, I just am real suspicious. So what am I missing? Tell me 
what I lack that I can't appreciate everything that you love about Trader Joe's. I don't think that they've never been a place to go because of their produce. They really have just ramped up their selection because people are already shopping there as a convenience. And they've only just started having more whole products. I don't know if they'll ever have whole cabbage, but um, if you do, you, where do you normally shop? Um, I think my go-to store, and again, it's close to me, is Jewel Asco. I also, there's a Pete's Market near me, and I live in a uh, town in southwest suburbs of Chicago where English is a second language. It's mainly Polish. And Pete's, and that's a joke. Um, Pete's Market has been outstanding when they moved in in having international foods like you wouldn't believe. And they cater to all the Slavic nations and the former, um, uh, you know, empire. Uh, so that's so. That's why I go there, and I go to Whole Foods. I do go to Whole Foods, but Whole Foods has packaged food too. It has it. No place does everything well. So I end up at several stores. I think, I mean, Trader Joe's has ongoing staples that people love. And now they have a lot of convenience foods. Like last night I had frozen pollock paneer with the spinach, with the chunks of cheese. I didn't have anything to eat in the house. And so they do, I mean, I think people who were diehards, a lot of people started shopping there a long time ago and kind of or in the groove of things you can't get anywhere else. Like they have Thai chili cashews that have real ground up kaffir lime leaves coating them. And I mean, if you really go through and look at what they have that you couldn't get anywhere else, I think that might give you the, I don't know if it'll give you the religion, but it'll <laughs> expose you to why people love it. Um, and Will if it be you there next it, time? Huh? Will it be there next month? Yeah, they, had, they ran out of those a couple years ago. I think there was some weird supply chain. I forgot if there had been a hurricane in Thailand or something. And I was like, I never thought they wouldn't have those. But that's a that's something they always have. Okay. And so I I definitely like I buy blue cheese there, feta cheese. I have these things, mm -hmm. and really great rotation of chips at very low prices. You don't want to discover it. Like they have some amazing blue corn chips with quinoa and other things. Um, and and at better prices than you find at Whole Foods. And you can kind of trust if you don't like it, you can bring it back. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of that combination of things, but they definitely wouldn't hold a candle to buying like pastries at a Polish market or whatever, or sausages, you know, from a butcher, I think. Mm -hmm. I actually don't really buy meat there, except they've expanded their salmon in there. Uh, it, the next time you're in the area, it might be fun just to look at, if you're into grocery stores, just look at everything to kind of see. So it's a place you go to discover things. Yeah, that's the whole, the whole so premise. If you've got a list, if you've got a list, you're, you're at your handicap by uh, requirements. Well, it's, it's not a full line grocery store. It's not, you know, Jewel Asco, full line. You get most everything you need. And you, when you go to Costco and do food shopping, you get certain items. Usually it's like high volume items. Um, you go to Aldi, it's not a complete line either. But, you know, you just like the full line grocery store, Jewel Osco is the place. But what's nice about Trader Joe's is there's just there's interesting foods a little bit off the beaten path, or at least it was. Yes. Now the beaten path is Trader Joe's, perhaps. Well, that's the, that's what interests me. 
And honestly, they used to have like the prices used to be more variable and you could find real bargains. And now they're more standardized, like a lot of cookies are $3.99 or crackers are $2.99. But they have ones you don't find anywhere else because yeah. they develop them like a Gorgonzola cracker. Yeah, these are good. They also have some lovely plants, different than you find anywhere else. Just amazing and inexpensive. And also, what does your book cover? Generally, what you have just discussed? Yes, generally, um, it's laid out in large print. And <laughs> Good. Look, look. <laughs> yeah, it's large, yes. I know. I, that was one direction I gave the designer. Yeah, it has more of the flyer and more discussion about it and more background about um, the business of the company. But... Yeah, there's like a lot more cheese and breads and kind of the history of Trader Joe's. <laughs> well, your talk is wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Do you have, and I know this is probably not likely, but do you have, uh, Patty Erd is right now in South Carolina and she was wondering, the closest Trader Joe's to where she's living is two and a half hours away. And she and her neighbors, you know, think if they keep writing, they'll, they'll get <laughs> a location nearby. Do you have any sense of how they choose their locations? I don't know, but I know someone who's on here on this Zoom from Maine, who's two and a half hours from one who's waiting for one to open. I'm sure it's the density of, um, you know, the vault, as you know, when you go to Trader, they're usually crowded. And if they don't have that um, turnover, I assume they it's a lower priority. But I don't know their science behind how they do it. And I know that both companies, all the Trader Joe's are very insular. You don't, you don't learn things very much. Yeah. And one thing I talked about in the flyer there, if if you're ever in the LA area, it might be fun to go to some of the original ones because they are in death defying small, they're small stores often on a busy street where you feel like you've accomplished something by not getting killed going in and out of the parking lot. And it's like that, like in the San Fernando Valley and in, in Los Angeles where it's sometimes they have to hire people to direct the traffic because it's so awkward. And so they would be in these very cheap areas. And now like they're in Manhattan, you know, near Columbus Circle in a basement and in these very high rent areas, but there was such pent up demand. I think they're doing very well now, even in the extremely high, re high priced real estate areas. Cynthia, I see you're unmuted. Do you want to make a comment? Well, no, I, actually, I had things to say, but I've seen Inga with her hand up for the last 20 minutes. So I'd like to direct <laughs> the, the conversation to her. Oh, I'm I, sorry. That's okay. Just, just a quick comment also. Uh, I, it's the place to go for greeting cards. I, that's the only place I buy greeting cards. They're $1 a piece, beautiful uh, 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 paper, good quality paper and I just buy them every time I walk in the store. That's the first thing on the right that's in my store. And um, that's the, I just buy them to have them around. It's a great quality. And someone mentioned the plants. I was there this morning about nine o'clock and I think I bought a half a dozen different plants. Yeah. They're just wonderful. I load up on the cards too. And they have things like Valrona chocolate bars and really good yes. mints. I mean, you really need, as a, if you're not familiar with it, you need to really go through, look at every bottle of wine. <laughs> they now apparently have an organic two buck chuck that has a rating. I don't know if it was from wine. Oh, Sun, no, it was Sunset Magazine. It won like a gold award, I think. Wow. <laughs> Which I thought, you know. Of course, I had to buy it to test it. <laughs> it's 
So, Cynthia, now you can say something? Okay. Well, just a couple of things. I think one of the things I appreciate is it seems to be like the last of the really great catalogs. Um, you know, we used to have, you know, like the Jay Peterman catalog and the Banana Republic catalog where you didn't get products, you got whole stories, whole lifestyles built around them. These whole worlds were created and you still get that with the Fearless Flyer. Um, you're not just buying corn chips, you're buying the whole history of Mexico. Um, I also, when I think of it, I don't think of it as a grocery store, I think of it as a playground. And it's a great place to go and shop for, for parties. I mean, if I get invited to a party, I had there because they're gonna have the wackiest chips I mean, last year I had a huge hit with somebody from the South by getting okra chips. You know, it was like the dried oak, and she went absolutely nuts. She had absolutely no idea these things existed. And it's like Trader Joe's. So, so it's fun for that. You know, I don't go there if I'm doing my real shopping. I do it for the fun shopping. One oh, thing you're... that I think is really interesting actually, because I'm, I'm into food traceability. Yeah. I mean, there are some things I don't buy because, okay, what? There, oh, hazelnuts from Oregon. Okay, this might be a bad example, but I know there were, I think, hazelnuts that were packed in Vietnam or, or in Turkey or something, but they were from Oregon. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's interesting. Some things don't have a country of origin on them. So like compared to Whole Foods or if you were going to a butcher that you could talk to, it's sort of interesting to read the package if you are interested to know the backstory of where something is from. There are macadamias during the pandemic. I loved, they ran, I think they ran out and then they had, they had them not private labeled, which is so rare, like you could see the effect of the pandemic on the food system, that they had the name Torn and Glasser, which is a huge nut and fruit importer in Los Angeles, on the, the macadamia packages. Like they must have just said, let's get them into the stores. And they didn't say Trader Joe's. And now I think they have a different brand of macadamias that I think still don't say Trader Joe's. So I love all that stuff. <laughs> Some people observe that uh, during this pandemic, uh, you know, they've been very good about controlling access to the restaurant and say, I mean, to the store and, yes. and sanitation. And somebody else made the comment. <laughs> Sorry about a cough there. Uh, that most items are shelf stable or frozen. So they were good for stocking up during this period of time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in I, fact, sometimes I, a lot of stores have already given up on the controlling, but Trader Joe's has never let that go. I was just going to say, you know, when they talk about if there's another shutdown, I, I have feta cheese and frozen organic spinach from Trader and eggs. And I'm like, I could live on making little frittatas with that, which I love. I bought my emergency supply of garlic, so I'm okay. I can, yeah. I can handle anything for a while. Well, and one of the things I love too is the humor of a lot of the product names. Um, I mean, a lot of them give background information on the food, but one, one of my favorites was, was the Trader Joe's Masters the Art of Beef Bourguignon. <laughs> that was the just name like let's product. see let's let's guess whose recipe they were using there masters the art so oh, it's yeah. just one of those <laughs> how fun there's a lot of fun there's a lot of a frozen thing it was a frozen dinner yeah oh and it was fabulous but it, but for me the the thing that got me to buy it was the name i actually you know there were some petitions a couple months ago to get rid of Trader Ming and Trader Joe. Yeah, yeah. And then apparently the news reported that they were going to, and then Trader Joe said, we're not getting rid of them. And an employee misspoke when they said that we were. And I was kind of like, that's why people like them because they stick to their, I mean, I know there are some petitions, like people complain that they had too much packaging on their produce and they've changed that. 
but um, I thought that was interesting, you know, that they stuck to their guns or their brand or whatever. I have to admit, and I, again, since I admitted, I didn't know who Deborah Madison is. I have moments where I live under a rock. I thought Trader Joe was like Betty Crocker. I did not know it was a real living person until I read his obituary. Yeah. I don't know uh, how many people had that same reaction, but that was certainly yep. mine. That's when I learned it. Okay, so I'm not wrong, right? Because <laughs> you got, you know, you get the little flyer, you know, you read through it, there's a little cartoons and all these things. I just assumed it wasn't a real person. And interestingly enough, from what I read, uh, when Trader Joe's was sold to Aldi in 1978, they remained independently operated. He continued to to keep, you know, running the running the show. Kathy, can I make another comment? Oh, absolutely. Okay, um, I bought probably a half a dozen different. Uh, gift items there um, within the last few days. I'd love to go in there every few days if I could, but I'm trying to be very careful because of COVID. But every few days now, just shortly before Thanksgiving and right up to Christmas, they have different gift items in, the, in one section and the chocolates are wonderful. And Edgar and I have almost devoured a box of the chocolate covered figs that are stuffed with a, um, a brandy truffle. Oh. I mean, oh, just eat one of those and that's dessert. They're just fabulous. But all their, their little gift items are wonderful. Their hand creams are great. Uh, it, it's just, it's my go-to fun store. Yes. Fun. I didn't see the figs today, but it is worth going right now for their selection of yeah. holiday food gifts. And they even had an advent calendar for cats that had <laughs> cat treats. Just shows, and now they have one, an advent calendar with lotions and beauty supplies. So they're just so innovative. Yes. And you never know what you're gonna find. That's true. I unmute myself. Uh, somebody commented here that the Trader Joe's has a podcast which I thought could be interesting. Maybe we can yeah, link to that. Yeah, it's really fun. So any more comments or questions? This was just great. I just, I was gonna say, just thank you. I joined at the last minute because I didn't have the link, unfortunately. <laughs> So I missed the uh, well, you know, this this program is simulcast on Facebook. Oh. And okay. uh, probably later this evening I'll go and edit the uh, podcast. So that should be up by tomorrow morning, if not later tonight. It just depends how I feel. But I had a nap this afternoon, so I probably can pull this off. Um and Pamela, you've made many, many comments. If you want, you can unmask yourself or unmute yourself and say say them. <laughs> you just like to write okay but you're welcome to say something if you'd like uh, anyway this has been great fun and if i know there's been a lively chat and if anybody wants to keep anything that was in the chat uh there's those three little dots and if you click on that it will save uh, a copy of the chat onto your hard drive so you can look at it later uh, scott you're here i know that uh, next program uh, for culinary historians will be I think it's next Wednesday but look it up no worries you know, those of you who are on the email list will get lots of naggy emails and I try not to be naggy but I have to tell you I have attended many presentations because I got an email the hour before say it's about to come on yeah. and I have completely uh, forgotten about it so uh, anything else thank you Catherine you are very thank welcome. you Thank you. Thanks for everyone's participation. <laughs> Thank really you. It was fun. it was wonderful. Thanks. Stay safe. Yes. Stay safe and uh... and take your B vitamins. <laughs> and, and, and those. <laughs> so they've now found that if you take the B vitamins, even if you get COVID, the the symptoms will be much milder.
and those miniature ice cream cones oh, yeah. covered with chocolate. Uh, to die that for. Like fun. <laughs> and that, that and that's from Edgar Rose, who, by the way, your your pecan pie recipe was on my Thanksgiving table this year, as always. Uh, Edgar Edgar uh, wrote the chapter on pecans for the Oxford Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink, nice. and uh, oh. and I have borrowed his information related to pecans for talks that I do occasionally. And, uh, but his recipe is an excellent one for, for pecan pie. So thank you, Mr. Rose. Yes. You're welcome. <laughs> and I always give attribution, especially if I know he's online. All right. Well, have a good holiday. You, and yes. uh, next week we have another program and then January is going to be full of lots of surprises. Cool. All right. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you for being here. Happy That's holidays. Great. Thank, thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.